And so first we're gonna start off with Terry McGovern. Hi everybody, can you hear me? So great to be here and thank you Michaela and thank you uh, for the entire team. I've never been so well treated. Maybe I need to get out more of New York, clearly. Um, I am a, a lawyer who's a chair of a department at a school of public health. Um, that's weird, uh, except it's not. I think we're talking about multidisciplinary approaches. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through some history that shows how kind of the science and the policy plays out in people's lives. Um, so I'm gonna begin uh, by talking about HIV. Um, and of course, just worldwide, women constitute more than half of all people living with HIV AIDS today. In the US, there are 34,800 estimated new HIV infections in 2019, 18% among women. Women of color are disproportionately affected Accounting for the majority of new infections, HIV incidence rates are much higher for black women and Latinas than for white women. The rate of new infection for black women was 11 times the rate for white women. The rate for Latinas, three times higher. So gender inequalities are a major driving force behind the AIDS epidemic. Now I'm gonna take you back in time to show you how I got involved in this work and how this played out in the lives of my clients. Uh, forgive this video. Actually, in 1989, I was at MFY Legal Services on 10th Avenue when I started to see all these women and low-income gay men who had AIDS, who were HIV positive, totally sick, couldn't get benefits, didn't technically have AIDS. I started then to take those cases, and but officially the HIV Law Project, where I got my first grant to start seeing just HIV clients, was at 35 Avenue A. Nothing was due to HIV. You know, later it became everything was due to HIV. But in those days, whatever was going on, well, it's not due to HIV, HIV doesn't cause this. You feel like your hands are tied because you know what's going on, all right, but you're being told, well, you don't have AIDS. You know, and you're like, well, what's going on with my body then? I mean, why do I feel so terrible? I knew that T cells were a marker of uh, basically how your immune system was doing. And maybe in a, in a healthy person, you might have 14 to 1600 T cells. And these women who were coming in had like six T cells, three T cells. I knew enough to know that they were very ill. The thing I remember most was how, what horrible medical care people were getting and how stupid their doctors were. RISA had looked through so many medical records and we were able to actually see this really clear pattern of, you know, pneumonias, tuberculosis, gynecological disease, very low T cell counts, and an absolute inability to qualify for social security disability. I had night sweats, I had uh, severe headaches, um, abdominal pain, constant vaginal infections, cervical cancer, um, a number of surgeries for the cervical uh, dysplasias, the cancer, and um, it was just real hard. It's hard, hard enough to deal with that when you're healthy, but when you're sick, and I was going to these people and telling them, please, you know, I need medical assistance so I can care for my daughter, and the doors were just getting shut in my face constantly. Dorothy's case was uh, really typical of a lot of the women's cases where I actually was with her at the hearing and she talked about how incredibly weak she was, how she couldn't lift her daughter. She actually cried when she talked about that. And uh, the denial came and uh, you can see it says, claimant's allegations of pain and functional limitation appear exaggerated and are not credible. I didn't actually know what was going on. I would take the cases, I couldn't win because I couldn't prove that they had AIDS. So I actually went to ACT UP to see if I could pick up any information about what was happening. There were these women at ACT UP, um, some of whom were HIV positive, some of whom were just activists talking about this thing, the CDC definition of AIDS, and talking about how it was based on studies of gay men, and therefore most of the illnesses that women were experiencing were not in the definition. I went back and started to actually use legal means to figure out who the CDC had actually studied, if it was really true that they had just studied gay men, um, 
if in fact there were medical articles that, that said that these diseases that I was seeing, pneumonia, TB, all these gynecological diseases were worse in the, in the presence of HIV. Um, so I began to try to explore whether I could make some kind of a legal challenge based on what I had heard from the activists um, that would hold up in court. I decided it would be more interesting for you to actually see that video than just hear me describe it because uh, it gives you a little context. Um, I think, uh, you know, throughout my career, I've actually focused on structural barriers that really create horrible outcomes for people worldwide. Um, so, you know, what this taught me very early on was actually science is not immune from, from kind of power and, uh, and science is actually really, really important, particularly when a lot of the agencies that figure out who should get what, who should get Medicaid, who should get disability, who should get housing are looking to the science. So um, it kind of launched me in a, on a career uh, that that very much was multidisciplinary. The reason I am at Columbia School of Public Health is that I needed researchers to document what I was seeing in my client populations. Um, and, and basically, we were able to show that there was a complete failure to consider the concept of converging epidemics in the early HIV work and to look at, in particular, what was happening with women. Um, and of course, how this played out in my clients' lives was that when they didn't get Medicaid or disability, they couldn't pay their rent, they would lose their housing, they would often lose their children. This was all before we had a treatment breakthrough in 1995. So the consequences of, of kind of an inadequate AIDS definition were huge. Um, we did follow that class action that was referred to um, working with physicians, researchers, um, and by the end of 1993, we won the lawsuit and the CDC expanded the AIDS definition. Um, and just to talk about that for a second, um, the consequences of that ex ex expansion um, were that the number of women with AIDS increased by 40%. So think about that. <laughs> 40%, the number of women with AIDS went up. So um, this was a policy situation that was actually creating a lot of discrimination. Um, and I feel like in those years when I was working just with low-income people with HIV, um, people just kept coming in the door that represented big policy problems in the science arena. So. Um, the next example, there are so many, but the next example, um, and this is just the, the data on the 40% increase, this is just shows you. Um, the, uh, so before life-saving HIV treatment became available, ACT UP and other groups had gotten kind of the FDA and others to allow people with HIV, men with HIV, to assume more risk to actually enter, you know, get early access to HIV clinical trials. Um, this was very important because obviously people had no treatment options. And I began to see women coming in who said, I'm trying to get into the DDI trial in New Jersey and they want me to have de detectable birth control. Um, or then I got a call, I had a bunch of those cases, then I got a call from a uh, physician at Johns Hopkins who said, I'm trying to get my female client with AIDS into a TAT trial, and they want her to undergo a sterilization before she can enroll. So in none of these cases were the women actually sexually active. In several of the cases, they were extremely ill with lots of gynecological disease. So this actually made no sense whatsoever. I took the cases, and pretty soon, 
the company that was involved with the TAT trial was waving at me an FDA guideline that said, women of childbearing potential, it was from 1994, women of childbearing potential should be excluded from the early phases of clinical trials. This was a post-thalidomide ruling, right? Um, but which was being kind of blindly applied in the context of AIDS. There was a life-saving exception that was being roundly ignored. Um, and so I began to do research with, again, my physician research colleague or colleagues into TAT itself, and did it have teratogenic properties, and in fact it didn't. Um, so this, all of this work led me to understand that there was an FDA guideline that was way overbroad, that was actually keeping women of childbearing potential out of early phases of clinical trials, which had huge ramifications, right? And, in, and there was actually nobody at the FDA that was looking at whether the, whether the drug at issue had been studied in other contexts, whether there was a reason to keep women out. So again, we filed the lawsuit and got the, uh, this, this guideline rescinded. Um, I was at the same time on the National Task Force on Age Drug Development. This was around 1994. Um, and I worked very hard with colleagues to get the task force to um, enact a regulation that prohibited the exclusion of women with life-threatening diseases from clinical trials based on reproductive capacity, and we kind of used the clinical hold mechanism. We tied it to the clinical hold mechanism. Um, but again, you see sometimes people walk in the door with these problems that really can lead you right to what I would call structural barriers. Um, these are structural barriers. So we couldn't win the client's cases without fixing the larger policy problem. <laughs> And the science could not be seen in a void separate from actually the realities of what was happening with people's lives. So, um, so very, very interesting and important lessons that kind of take me through my career um, and, and teach me a lot about the failure to kind of see converging forces. So just to... Uh, to talk a little bit about um, some other issues. So you all know environmental factors, air and water quality are fundamental determinants of health. And we also know that environmental conditions play an important role in producing and maintaining health disparities. I teach an environmental justice class that really looks a lot at environmental racism where, because there's just overwhelming evidence that, you know, toxic facilities are disproportionately placed in communities of color and low-income communities. So um, it was no surprise to me when COVID hit that we would see increased COVID-19 impacts in communities of color because of what I knew about underlying disease burden uh, respiratory issues, um, and of course, had seen in HIV, the failure to kind of look at converging epidemics uh, is a huge, huge blind spot often in the policy making process. We saw the alarming trend of COVID-19 mortality in black populations in Chicago, Los Angeles, Michigan, um, all blacks comprise the majority of COVID-19 deaths despite being a small percentage of the overall population. In New York City, we saw Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, also way, more, way worse COVID outcomes than more affluent areas in New York City. Um, Re Queens residents were 31% of the city's cases, 30% of the city's death, um, deaths. Why? Uh, because of uh, much of the mapping that my students often do, uh, that you see very strong, clear evidence of, you know, placement of toxic facilities in these incomes, uh, in these areas, uh, all kinds of facilities that house waste. Um, and, you know, there's been really 
problems with the Environmental Protection Agency uh, really policing or regulating any of this. Um, a whopping 80% of the entire city's trash is processed in three low-income communities in New York City. Um, so the examples of why we see the outcomes we saw in COVID are kind of endless. Um, and, you know, the EPA is obviously impacted by who's the president, by the politics that we're living in. Um, and so I guess I have to continue to say um, that you cannot do this work, public health work, science, without looking at politics. Um, and of course, we saw, you know, lots and lots of issues in COVID. Also, you know, increases in gender-based violence, a move towards not calling certain services essential early on all over the world. Um, and I think, you know, all of this brings me back to the point that we absolutely have to look through multi-lenses to kind of figure out how to solve problems in infectious disease. I wanna talk a little bit about some work we're doing uh, to look at the impact of aggregate environmental and climate and environmental exposures on black maternal mortality and preterm birth. Um, as you know, the US has an unacceptably high maternal mortality rate. Few, one of the few high-income countries where the rate is increasing. Black women bear the he heaviest burden, dying from pregnancy-related complications at a much higher rate. And of course, uh, risk experience translate into adverse fetal health outcomes. Um, so this is the background as we kind of sail into this moment, which you know I can't not talk about, which is, we're about to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Um, and again, uh, I have to ask the question about science and public health and what is going on here. 22 states have laws or constitutional amendments that will severely limit or end abortion once Roe is repealed. Four states do not currently have abortion bans but are likely to ban abortion. 13 states have proposed Texas-style bans on abortion. Most would ban abortion after six weeks of pregnancy, and all of them include a bounty hunter enforcement mechanism that has roots in fugitive slave laws. Um, we are coming into, uh, you know, kind of this, this period where fetal personhood laws are being introduced all over the place, and criminal liability is increasing, not just for abortion, but a whole range of negative pregnancy outcomes. Um, Louisiana introduced legislation that explicitly classifies abortion as homicide. It didn't go through, but there is a huge risk that this new trend in laws could lead to the crim criminalization of emergency contraception and types of birth control. Um, I don't want to just paint this horrible picture, but it is really, really important to notice that what is happening has nothing to do with science and evidence. Um, and we will see increase, we will see pregnant people harmed, we will see children harmed. One of the things that becomes really clear when you start to look at um, children being born uh, when the, the person carrying the child did not want to have the child. They're often absorbed into foster care systems in these states that are often under court order because there's so many abuses and they are hugely, hugely worst outcomes for children of color. So again, the question is, if we care so much about life, what about these children? What's happening to these children? So, um, so unfortunately, uh, having had a long career kind of working to reduce teenage pregnancy, working to reduce and prevent infectious disease acquisition, working to reduce maternal mortality, most of us have to now spend a lot of time doing things like I've been doing, which is meeting with prosecutors, 
What are the public health reasons not to prosecute? How can we use HIPAA to, why doesn't HIPAA cover crisis pregnancy centers? There's so much happening. Who is funding the election of the judges that will be deciding on these criminalization cases? We are coming into an era that is somewhat unbelievable. Almost every day I wake up thinking, is this a dream or did I just come back from Wisconsin where I listen to people talk about what they're doing? There's many tracks, right? How do we just make sure people still are able to get care? Many people were saying, we're, we don't want anything to do with policy. Forget policy, we can't win. We're just gonna create like an underground railroad. Um, you can't forget policy. Obviously, you can't forget policy because think about what's going to happen when people are prosecuted. Um, we already know, just going along with everything else I said, that criminalization of any type disproportionately affects communities of color. So we're going to see a lot of uh, kind of disparity in who is prosecuted. Um, so very, very serious times, um, the, the one positive in all of it is the way that at the state level on the ground, people are finally understanding that voting rights and environmental you know, justice and reproductive justice, it's all connected. I would posit that it's white supremacy that is the glue that holds all this stuff together. And it's a huge, huge problem that we have seen all of these issues in silos um, because it is gonna be a question of who is the judge that gets the case about whether you know, the FDA's rulings around medication abortion stand or the state regulations stand. So you can't actually ever step back and say the science is, is completely separate from the voting rights issues from the funding issues. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is groups really coming together to understand that it's all one piece and it can't really be separated. Um, I, think, I think that um, one of the things that our students are really demanding increasingly uh, is that we talk about, you know, strengths of communities, not just disparities, but the incredible strengths and ways that communities figure out how to survive, how to prosper, even in the face of all kinds of extreme structural barriers. I think we will see the best of, of people in this next period uh, as Roe gets overturned. Um, again, the incredible strengths and strategic ways that I'm seeing people at the state level figure out how they're gonna protect pregnant people. Um, but I have to raise, you know, again say, why, why are we devoting all this energy to this? Why couldn't we be continuing to reduce, you know, all of the pot negative health outcomes that exist? And of course, you all know, but just to say the states that are leading the charge on overturning Roe are the states with the worst health outcomes for women and children, particularly of color. So I think, I think you know, as we move forward uh, after the COVID pandemic, et cetera, that we cannot move forward without many disciplines working together. We cannot move forward without a lot more strategy on, on how to fix some of the kind of runaway problems that have, create, have been created uh, in public health. Um, and I also think that, um, that we all have a lot to learn from each other from dif different disciplines. We have very, very complicated meetings about how to proceed on issues because we have doctors and lawyers and researchers and social scientists, but the work is always better after that. Um, so I am actually really, really thrilled to be able to be here today um, and want to thank you all and, uh, and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you.
I actually had a question. <laughs> Sorry, I was walking from the back of the room. Um, yeah, first of all, it's an honor to be here today, and I so appreciate the work that you've done. Um, for me, like as a student, something that's been so frustrating during COVID is the misinformation, especially when it's coming from within the scientific community, like from other students. And yesterday I was speaking with some students about like Peter Duisberg is a professor still, and like this is a guy who told the South African government that HIV didn't cause AIDS. Um, and so I just wanted to get a little bit more of your thoughts on this idea that like, what can we do when we have these colleagues who aren't living in the realm of evidence and like, where is this all coming from? How is this thread moving through all of these issues? I mean, I wish I could give you a perfect answer for that. I mean, I think uh, there are just p people who just do not want to pay attention to, to evidence and to facts, right? Um, I think there's a lot of people in the public who just need to hear the information differently. So leaving aside your colleague, I think how we communicate as public health people or scientists is a huge problem. We need to really think about. There's obviously a huge amount of um, suspicion based on hundreds of years of racism and sexism. So all of that has to be addressed. And I think we need to think a lot more about what, how we can actually move people and what works. Um, I always like to say I was in Ireland when they were trying to overturn the constitutional prohibition on abortion, and they were successful because they had long conversations with very conservative people who were against abortion about maternal mortality and about the, the children who had died in their families. I watched a very different kind of conversation that was actually about people's lives and not extremes, and it worked. So I think we have to re-examine our communications. Thank you. Sure. And then we have two questions in the Q&A. The first one is from Madeline Peters, who says, thank you for an absolutely fantastic talk. I would love to hear you talk about a million things. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the cost of HIV AIDS diagnosis and treatment, both in terms uh, to like capitalist companies and also the government, and if maybe that had been a part in the hesitancy to include women in diagnoses. That's another big question. Um, so obviously, you know, as, as, as you probably all know, um, we had treatment available here way before it was available anywhere in the world, and that had huge impacts on women. And in fact, they had to bring a lawsuit in South Africa to get pregnant women access to treatment to, to reduce transmission. Um, so I think uh, cost, and obviously this has plagued us in the COVID pandemic as well. What does it actually cost to create drugs? Who has access to them? Patent issues? All of, I mean, that's another talk, but a lot of my work in HIV was around, you know, trying to get some of the long patent protections waived so that people could have access to drugs. Same issues once again in COVID. And frankly, I worked at the Ford Foundation a bunch of years in between, and we had a very strong intellectual property right to health line of work, which a president at, of the foundation came in and got rid of. And I, it broke my heart when, when COVID hit because None of those groups were funded anymore in India, Brazil, South Africa. So again, strategy, what are we doing? How are we preparing? Um, and the issue of access and money and corporate accountability runs through all of it. And then last question. Oh, yep. oh. oh sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> sorry. So I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question and I just really first off wanna say that I value the research that you're doing and I think it has super important impacts and policy implications that really highlight the connectedness by like data, de data driven decision making. Um, and one of the things that I find is oftentimes um, in public health spaces as an epidemiologist, I hear when we say data driven decision making, we're thinking about how we can use the data to explain things to policymakers and resource allocators. I'm wondering what are your thoughts about, I mean, sorry, and that still relies on us to 
trust the policymakers and the resource allocators to actually do the right thing by the data or make decisions based on that data. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on like how we can reorient science communications to marginalized communities so that they have the access to the resources to allocate, like to advocate for themselves um, without hundreds of thousands of dollars of education like I've been you know, fortunate to have. Thank you. Very good question. I mean, one thing is, first of all, you know, I, I, you know, the data does not reflect a lot of stuff. So, for example, globally in abortion, they don't track under 14, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's huge gaps in our data, right? So you also have to have a kind of critical thinking about data. Mm -hmm. Who's left out? Who's there? Who isn't? What are they actually collecting? What's, you know, obviously all kinds of classifications are problematic. I think, you know, we've been doing a project with folks in three states, one of which is going to, you know, have abortion become illegal any second on what kinds of data is to the community groups want and need. Um, and we have on the team quantitative, qualitative researchers, and it's really a negotiation process, right? We don't want, we get to hear from them, we don't want you to just throw all these numbers at us. We actually want a much slower breakdown of who's here, who isn't here, what's not reflected. So I think we have to really take this community-based participatory research concept and do it in a way more slow, <laughs> negotiated way. Um, it's actually exactly, so many people said, how did you figure out that the AIDS definition was a problem? Well, a woman walked in the door over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk to people on the ground, you get a lot of answers. It's complicated though, mm -hmm. and slow, but worth it. <laughs> Thank you so much, You're I really welcome. appreciate your talk. Thank you. And then the last question from the virtual, oh, thanks for whoever shouted that, by the way. I don't have good peripheral vision. You mentioned that bounty hunter enforcement laws for abortion, what do those mean? Um, so basically, beginning with Texas, which the Supreme Court l allowed to take effect, much to much breaking my lawyer heart, um, basically puts created this situation where inviting people to people to report on anybody who not only performs an abortion, assists somebody in having an abortion, and in some states, monetary rewards to people who report. Um, and this is gonna, once Roe goes, these, there's a huge number of states that have these. So lots of legal questions, but very, very scary when you think about healthcare. This is, this is a healthcare issue, right? Um, incentivizing people to report out other people. So, so the place that, the only place you can find in US law where laws like this have existed was really fugitive slave laws. So that's why I said that, that's where it comes from. So, tremendously horrifying. Um, there will be lots of, question, lots of problems prosecuting because you need a medical record, you need evidence. So I invite you all to think about that, HIPAA, et cetera, but lots and lots of questions and we never thought that the Supreme Court would let that Texas law stand. So um, yeah, it's bounty hunting. Thank you. Thank you so much.